uh, let me say first that it really uh, was a pleasure to be there at that first summit and to wonder whether there would be a second summit. But if uh, anyone knows Anula uh, Bike Dabiri well, she certainly is one who is so determined and so committed that I'm sure that we are going to not only have the second summit, we are going to have several other summits. But at that first summit, we were focused on the investment opportunities and our macroeconomic context. That was uh, this is the theme of what I spoke about. But the theme of this second summit is clearly meant to be complementary, which is leveraging diaspora resources for economic growth. So my very brief remarks today will focus on the hows of bringing in diaspora resources. How do we mobilize resources for both foreign direct investment and portfolio investment? And how, how do we effectively market these vehicles? Also, should we not, as has been suggested in some studies of the problem, and there is a particular study of the problem from which I have, uh, from which I have taken quite a few ideas, but the questions that have been raised in some of those studies is how do we explore the prospects of international cooperation to make the mobilization of assets across borders easier? Could we, for example, work out rules by which our local banks can accept assets located abroad as collateral? And how does that really work? You know, how do we make that easy? There's a very excellent work done by Aaron Terrazas uh, it's tackling diaspora investments in developing and emerging capital markets. It really speaks to some of the very concrete issues that we are meant to be talking about uh, today. And I borrowed quite a few of the questions and ideas that have been raised in that very uh, important survey. Some international agencies, for example, uh, USAID and OPIC, and these are two US agencies, they have supported diaspora investments in their countries of origin through risk reduction. Of course, we have USAID here. What USAID does uh, is uh, that they focus on lenders in the country of origin. OPIC, on the other hand, uh, focuses on diaspora investors who are US citizens. But of course, there are several of our diaspora investors who have dual citizenship. Then they have the Development Credit Authority, DCA, which is also a US government initiative. And this has provided partial credit default guarantees. For example, we've seen that being used for Eth Ethiopian en entrepreneurs in diaspora who have been able to access uh, bank credit. I think that we, uh, Nigerians in diaspora, can also access uh, some of these products of, of, of these US agencies, especially, of course, for those who live in the US. The way it works generally is that credit guarantee allows US aid to partner banks to mobilize locally held assets and savings. Then the, DS, uh, the DCA guarantees 50% of losses in cases of default. So, there is, so these two agencies sort of work together uh, the, and the, as I said, they are both U.S. agencies, not only to guarantee losses, but also to even guarantee a specific value of those losses. Also, OPIC so, uh, supports U.S. registered companies investing overseas by offering discounted insurance to protect against currency risk. Now, the sort of currency risk that they protect against is one that I think we frequently encounter. That is the possibility that an investor may have difficulty converting profit or capital from local currency to dollars. And that's a, that, that's a risk that we, of course, face in many emerging economies and we face here as well. And also political risk and expropriation risk. We don't have those kinds of problems here. Certainly, we don't have expropriation risk here. So now it's entirely possible to work with both local and international agencies to seek ways of de-risking diaspora investments to encourage more investments, uh, more interest in local investment opportunities. I'm glad to see that our sponsor today, United Capital, is one that is in the forefront of, of, these, kinds of, of these kinds of initiatives. And I also saw, I think it's called uh, Simplify, I think it's called, 
who are also doing something quite innovative in this respect. So we may look, for example, at ways by which uh, the Nigeria incentive-based risk sharing system for agricultural lending, the very long name, but the short, uh, the, the, the acronym for it is NISAL or NERSAL, PLC. Now what NERSAL does is, is that it can de-risk diaspora investments in agriculture and agribusiness. NERSAL's mandate is to stimulate the flow of affordable finance and investments into the agricultural sector by de-risking the agribusiness finance value chain. So NESAL presents a real opportunity in my view for those who want to invest in agriculture from the diaspora, especially to look at how to de-risk uh, their, their investments. So how can we make diaspora bonds or diaspora mutual funds work? Interest in previous attempts at diaspora bonds appear to have just attracted mainly institutional investors. And I think that we've had problems, a bit of problems with establishing the diaspora bond as one that individual investors, single investors can put their resources into. It appears that the ones we've had, or the, the, the attempt we made, was only able to attract uh, institutional investors and they took it all up. But I think that we have to make this, we have to make this so accessible and so interesting for individual investors that all of us uh, in the diaspora can actually put in uh, resources. How do we mobilize non-institutional diaspora funds? I think we can explore how diasporans in the financial industries, in their countries of residence, can partner with local private capital companies to raise capital in both jurisdictions for investment. So very much is possible. There's a lot that, that is possible. In the past four years, our major focus as a government has been on infrastructure development, rail, roads, bridges, power. Our infrastructure spend is by far the largest in Nigeria's history. Yet the infrastructure deficits remain quite significant. We have major funding gaps, as I'm sure those of you who are following uh, the debates on the budget have seen. Part of the solution is private sector collaboration by way of tax credits for investments in public infrastructure. And we put that out there, that we're prepared to partner with private sector individuals who want to put in their resources for tax credit. Of course, it involves a fair amount of money. We've had a few takers, but I'm sure that there are those in the diaspora that can mobilize the kind of resources that can be invested in, in this kind of public-private sector partnerships for infrastructure and derive significant benefit from it and, if possible, tax credits. The other is the infrastructure fund. The fund at the moment has only received institutional investors, but there is, in my view, room for investment from diaspora funds as well. Such investments, especially when managed with the known expertise of our Nigerian Sovereign Wealth Fund, can be both safe and profitable. So we have an infrastructure fund. It's managed by the NSIA, the Sovereign Wealth Fund. But as I've said, so far, all we've seen are investments from institutional investors. We think that diasporans can benefit from this significantly, and we as a nation can benefit from it. Our focus so far has been on renewable energy. For example, in the power sector, you know, We've done quite a bit of work in renewable energy, and this again presents opportunity, especially with our green bonds. We have something called a green bond, which is Africa's largest sovereign environmental fund. It's the, it's the largest sovereign fund of its kind anywhere uh, on the continent. And that's also one which we think there can be some interest by uh, our, our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. The bond issuance has done so well and has been supported by very uh, lucrative investments. What, what we've tried to do with, uh, with, with that bond is basically to focus on certain specific areas of investments in renewable energy. So for example, we have a program called Energizing Education. This program is run by the Rural Education Agency. What it seeks to do is to improve access to power for 37 Nigerian universities, federal universities, and 
seven teaching hospitals across the country. It will also impact the residents of surrounding communities, uh, over a million people, all told. The whole idea of this, uh, the whole idea of this particular program is that we are providing private sector funding for solar power initiatives in, in our federal government universities. So, so far we have a total of about 119 megahertz of power, uh, which, we, which we are uh, providing, and about 60 megahertz of power of that is purely solar. Only last month at the Bayero University in Kano, we commissioned the largest hybrid solar plant in Africa as part of this uh, Green Bond uh, initiative. So it's doing really incredible things. The bond is one that provides resources for several things. And we think that uh, the diasporans can invest in this bond because, uh, as we've seen, it's a very lucrative bond. And at the same time, it has an important uh, economic and environmental purpose. And these purposes have been served very well. So the possibilities are many. And I hope we are going to spend some time today, I'm sure uh, you might have spent some time yesterday, looking closely and scrutinizing the options uh, for mobilizing diaspora capital for local investment. There are so many uh, different opportunities and we can't talk about them all. But I think that we should, uh, we should look at some of the local opportunities that have been provided even now. Government is providing some. The financial institutions are providing quite a few. The central bank has also been extremely proactive in providing products that can be of some interest to our diasporas. So let me again commend the excellent work done by the Diaspora Commission. I remember the days when we just used to talk about the diaspora, the diaspora, and diasporans just used to talk about how they were neglected and ignored and all of that. But that is all changing now. We're meeting regularly, we have a commission, and we have devoted leadership. So I think the future is extremely bright, and I think that it will greatly benefit our country. So I hope that this summit will take us to the next level in that journey. Thank you all very much.